Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you're zooming in from. Um, welcome to our uh, Hyperledger member in-depth webinar with Cripsy and their partner Cloud4C. We're happy to have you here, and we're just going to wait a couple of minutes to give everybody a chance to join. While we wait, I would encourage everybody to uh, use the chat button uh, to say hello and tell us where you're zooming in from. I'm zooming in from uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and it's very exciting because our panelists for today are zooming in live from HIMSS conference in Orlando. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, depending on where in the world you're zooming in from. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes uh, to give everybody a chance to join, and then we're going to start with our webinar for today. While we wait, I would encourage everybody to use the chat button and say hello and tell us where you're zooming in from. see a few people here saying hello. Yeah, got somebody from All Toronto right. there. Oh, we got our Canadian friends. We got our US friends. I've got somebody out of Michigan as well. It's great. Wow, right Mumbai. across the pond. Oh, wow. From nice. India. Mumbai, India. <laughs> hello, welcome. Hello, welcome. All right, so I think we can get started now. So hello everybody again and welcome for joining us live today. Today we have a very exciting session for you uh, because we have our Hyperledger member Cripsy uh, joining us live from HIMSS conference in Orlando along with this very special guest appearance, Cloud4C. My name is Tomasz and I'm an ecosystem manager at the Hyperledger Foundation. Today, I'm gonna to have a chance to introduce our panelists and also take you through some housekeeping. So first, and if you uh, joined any of our other webinars in the past, you know that we have some housekeeping. First of all, I would like to emphasize that everybody's welcome in the Hype Ledger community and we strive to say, create a safe and welcoming environment for everybody. So please uh, uh, follow our code of conduct uh, when interacting with each other on the webinar or in the community more general as well. You can find our code of conduct uh, on our website and also on our wiki. All of the Hyperledger Foundation webinars are held under the LF uh, Linux Foundation antitrust policy because they include industry competitors. And you can find our antitrust policy on our website and on our wiki as well. This session is being recorded and it will be later available on our YouTube channel as well as in our webinar library along with the slides so you can always download those. Um, we, uh, we are also live on YouTube and LinkedIn Live, so uh, welcome also everybody joining us from there. Now we encourage these webinars to be very active and the more active uh, everybody is, the better experience for everybody. So feel free to raise your hand and I will unmute you and then you can ask your questions to the panelists. Uh, if you would prefer not to speak, you can also use the Q&A box uh, and the panelists will either type the questions or answer it live. And you can also use the chat button uh, to get your questions answered. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, so we have Emal Rustemi, Director of Business Development at Cripsy, um, is, who is joined by <clears throat> Rocco Monteleone, 
um, and uh, Miguel Vilches, who with, uh, with their partners from Cloud4C, joining us live from Orlando, Florida. And we also have the Mohit Sethi, who is a VP Technology and Research at Cripsy. And uh, it is my great pleasure to have this webinar today. And without further ado, Emal, uh, over to you. Great, thank you, Tomas. Thank you for the warm introduction. Just want to make one slight correction. We we had a last minute change up. Instead of Miguel, we have uh, Sama Sikander here. Uh, if you want to do a quick introduction. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Osama, and I'm the VP of Pre Sales for Cloud Corsi. It's a pleasure being here. Yes. Yeah, we actually replaced a superstar with an even larger superstar <laughs> for our live, live stream today. So we're in good hands, my friends. That's it. Yeah. And, and we're, we're live, as Tomas said, at the HIMSS conference, which is the Healthcare Information and Management System Society conference. It's here in Orlando. Um, it's from March 11th to March 15th. It's actually the largest healthcare information management conference. It is. It is. Um, this with, is definitely one of the larger ones. There's another event that happens in Dubai as well. Mm -hmm. This one here today, I think we got about 30,000 yeah, about yeah. 30, So yeah. there's a lot of movement, a lot of people, a lot of great technologies that are being exposed here. And uh, we're just happy to be a part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> it's almost like a mini city to some degree. Yeah. yeah we've been that's a good way to describe it. Um, it healthcare players of all types. Um, we've been hearing a lot of uh, interesting thoughts and ideas about what, what priorities, what initiatives healthcare organizations have. And, you know, one of our focuses is um, to help organizations uh, manage their data a little bit more effectively and look at um, the security standards and measures they have and make sure they're up to date, make sure they're um, aligned with the leading trends to be as secure as they can be. Um, and, you know, when, when we're talking about it over the past few days, we, you know, when we look at healthcare data management, we're wondering why it's so important to, to, to look at this area and why we need to make sure security standards are up to par. You know, a few different areas we've, um, you know, took into consideration is patient confidentiality, right? Yes. When we're looking at some of the personal information, you're dealing with whether it's talking about medical history, whether it's talking about diagnosis uh, and treatments, <clears throat> this could be very sensitive information. One, you know, from a subjective standpoint, right? You know, uh, I, I, for example, wouldn't feel so comfortable giving my information out Absolutely. to anybody and everybody. But the other side of the coin is, you want to be able to give some information out maybe oh, yeah. because it could be beneficial for a healthcare community, yeah. right? For R and D purposes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it doesn't matter which vertical you do look at. I mean, other verticals like security's front and center with any vertical that you deal, with, whether it's retail, finance, uh, but even more so when you're dealing with healthcare, it's very personal to, to uh, patients and whatnot. And they, take you know they take issue these this is personal information this is health information it's out there so we have to make sure that we secure it we harden it and one of the interesting te technologies that's available today is blockchain um it's in its infancy you know it's still at the at the uh adoption stage of thing but there is uh more and more of an interest within blockchain to use it uh to secure and harden environments uh in terms of when it comes to personal health information so yeah, yeah, what is that? absolutely. I mean, it's um, it's not just looking at the, the the application and the use cases itself, right? We we have to look at the the overall impact of it, right? We think about like some hospitals being hit with ransomware. Mm -hmm. You know, it's they're they're holding on to the data of the patients and the, the doctors, the physicians. They're not able to access that. Um, they, there are implications to, in this case, it's a life and death situation, Absolutely. and it makes it even more important to ensure that you know the, the right individuals, the right teams, have access and control over that data. Right. So, completely agree. I mean, when you look at some of the breaches that are happening, and uh, you know, specifically to the U.S., I mean, you're looking at approximately about ten million dollar per breach is the average. Oh yeah. You know, and it's growing, and uh, I get it. It's a big concern. Uh, for us, you know, we take a very holistic view at how we secure the environment. You know, we definitely look at the people side of it. Uh, people are the weakest link at the end of the day. We look at the processes that are involved and the underlying technology that's uh, available for us to use. And blockchain brings a, a, an element of really excitement. Yes, it's new, mm -hmm. but in terms of the innate 
qualities that it has in terms of being able to secure um, the, um, the data for, for healthcare patients is becoming more and more uh, acceptable. Um, I always tell that whenever you have a new technology, and uh, those of you who remember when we look at cloud, go back a dozen years, and people used to look at me and say, are you, are you kidding me? You want me to move my data, my <laughs> workloads? Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. They'd say, take the workloads from my on-prem, from my data center, and move them where? Into yeah. the cloud. So that was like almost alien to them. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing that's happening with blockchain. And it is new. Um, however, it's slowly evolving. And what you're finding is, uh, and what I tell some of our clients is, you know, take baby steps. Uh, some of the things we do is, again, there's, there's, there's simple pilot programs that you can do. You can do proof of values where you're working with, um, let's say, non-sensitive data, non-mission critical, where you can test get comfortable. It's, it was the exact same thing we did with cloud and it applies to blockchain technology as well. Small, simple baby steps is the way to go to get things moving. Absolutely. <clears throat> you know, you guys brought up a good point about patient privacy and, you know, nice. the fact that there's still a lot of cyber attacks in the healthcare space. I don't know. I think it was a few weeks ago where we saw that United Healthcare Group yes. got attacked, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and when you're, when you're thinking about patient uh, data, Yes, to some degree, it does make patients uncomfortable to have that data disclosed pu publicly. But beyond that, it could result in a life and death situation, right? When you're dealing with identity theft related concerns, mm -hmm. you're dealing with potentially patient discrimination. Let's be honest, that's still a concern between practitioners and patients. And lastly, it's the emotional distress. Who's dealing with my data? How are they dealing with it, right? And we want to make sure we're mitigating any discomfort, any concerns that patients have. Right. And that's where blockchain, I think, is going to be really, really impactful. Right. Setting up those frameworks, setting up those protocols, those networks to really protect the data and to really help patients, practitioners uh, <clears throat> increase efficiencies. But right? I think when I think about blockchain, there's three words I think about it. And I, I frame it as I was telling you yesterday, Rocco, it's TTI, yes. trust, transparency, immutability. Transparency is always a very sensitive topic, especially when we're talking about meeting HIPAA standards and GDPR. And don't standards. forget Pip Pipita in Canada. Pipita, Pipita, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we've, we've got to represent Canada as well here, right? <laughs> of course, 100%. Um, yeah, so the, these are very, very real concerns. When you're dealing with data transmission, also, are you doing it in a compliant fashion, right? Are you, and, and it's always very, very tough when you're dealing with large data sets like patient data, <clears throat> but you have to handle it almost at an acute level. So how are we doing that to, in a way that's low cost and we're doing it seamlessly? Well, that's where blockchain comes in, right? If you look at you know, current systems, current data systems, and uh, we talked about one hospital network where some of them are still dealing with very, very old firmware, right? Where they're not, you have a hospital old network. firmware, antiquated systems that, that cause a lot of headaches. It's anytime you have old technology in place, uh, right. again, it just opens the door for breaches. Yep. Uh, those are security concerns and gaps, right? Yep. And again, these are some of the areas that, you know, we'll touch upon that yep. blockchain can definitely address. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's definitely prohibitive when you start thinking about, mm. you know, innovation. Because if you're not innovating, you're pretty much being left behind. Yeah. Yeah. So with these archaic systems, you know, they're not able to adapt, they're not able to integrate, and it just leaves them behind. They're not able to use that data for, for the right purposes. 100%. Yeah. yeah. 100%. And the other thing you got to think about as well, and again, even if you zoom out, again, like, you know, we were just kind of touching on a use case there, but some of the other uh, areas that it's quite applicable and, and it really has a perfect fit for is uh, supply chain. Uh, there is uh, fake medicine, fake pharmaceuticals uh, that are not authentic out there. What if we had a system that can trace the point of origin all the way down through the series of steps before as soon as it gets to the patient? So now you have a blockchain technology as an example where you'll be able to track exactly the point of origin, the manufacturer, where the pharmaceutical was made step by step as it gets routed right down to the pharmacy to the patient you'll know every point in time as to where that pharmaceutical took 
to get to the patient itself. How beautiful is that? That that's such a technology. Again, it's something that again, there's companies that are pushing this, that are, want this to evolve. There is a marketplace for it, and uh, it's just a, a beautiful use case yes. to really consider when I'm, you think I'm, about it, right? I'm glad you brought that up, Rafa. That's actually one of my favorite yeah. use cases within healthcare and beyond. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I've seen it. Uh, I see it as an industry agnostic uh, solution, but particularly for healthcare. I mean, just think, what happens if you have counterfeit or um, you know, when, when you have drugs flowing through supply chain and it gets tampered with? That's, again, a life and death situation. We want to try and mitigate that. Right? So we're talking about the manufacturing, the distribution, being yep. able to effectively in real time as well. Right? In, in today's supply chain system, there's a delayed effect, right? Yes. And as I like to say, being from New York, time is money to some degree. You get in and you get real we time. We say that in Toronto too. All right, all right. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I can't trademark that. And my my apologies. <clears throat> but um, you know, when you're when you're looking at that, real time access to data, at least from what I've seen, will create efficiencies uh, by twenty to thirty percent in terms of cost savings, right? And you know, <clears throat> there's a few different solutions we've seen in the markets particularly that are using Hyperledger, uh, the Hyperledger network. Um, MediConnect is a, <clears throat> it's a great platform that's tracking uh, the journey of pharmaceuticals from the manufacturer down to the pharmacies, down to the retail organizations out there. It's a beautiful solution. You're creating transparency where all stakeholders in the supply chain ecosystem can access the data, see the appropriate data that's good for their, that's necessary for their organization. So you have privacy concerns being addressed. You have standard protocols and standard regulations being complied with, yep. which is really, really great. <clears throat> but, you know, let's, you know, speaking of MediConnect uh, and, and speaking of the Hyperledger net Network, this is the Hyperledger Foundation. Yep, yep. I, you know, I think it's good to talk about the benefits of leveraging the Hyperledger Fabric Network. You know, how does it compare to other networks? What is it like dealing with public versus uh, permission to private networks? And uh, I'm going to put Mohit on the spot here, but I, I'd love for Mohit, who's um, our VP uh, of solutions and has a lot of expertise in this field. If you could share some insight on that, Mohit, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, I'm Al. Thanks for... Uh, am I audible? Yes, yeah, yeah. Sure yes. are. Loud and clear. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so see, uh, see the perspective of uh, talking about the field of medical and then talking about blockchain, whether it is public or private. So the very first thing is most of the public chains have different types of consensus protocol. They they are mainly developed to, to solve another problem. But here we are talking about the field of medicine, medical and enterprises. So it's only what comes to my mind or and, uh, I think anyone who have been deep into blockchain is only hyperledger fabric which is not only for the enterprises, but uh, also the scale and the privacy parameters. Most of the blockchains, again, they have something which is a consensus protocol, which is suited for a particular case. In Hyperledger Fabric, it is like for our use case, we could define what is the endorsement policy. In, uh, in turn, we are defining how the, uh, how the consensus should be. It should be based on the business behavior, not a common global behavior. These are like one of the basic foundation. Privacy is very important. Like everyone would have known about how Hyperledger is scalable. We can we just need to tune the infrastructure, our code, and it is available. But uh, certain things like private data collections, which will be very handy in case of medical field, because GDPR and other regulatory aspects, it makes things very complicated because the true nature of blockchain is uh, transparency and immutability which goes against the foundation of a typical GDPR and the privacy, right? It becomes. So how to have the benefit of blockchain angle immutability and also preserve privacy, ensuring customer data is protected. It is completely authorized. It is only between the organizations or the hospitals, uh, like in our case, who have authorization to see it. Plus a common platform is able to track where and all this data have moved. These are the basics for building any privacy sensitive uh, application on blockchain. So there is nothing else which will put apart from Hyperledger Fabric. And then we have so many tools and SDKs across multiple languages. The ecosystem have evolved. I've been working uh, since 0 0.6 uh, when it was just in alpha and 1.0, 2.0, and now we will have 3.0. So always the upgrades are made for 
benefiting the uh, adoption challenges, high efficiency, and the enterprise uh, uh, good adoption rate. So this is uh, in nutshell, but uh, I would be happy to answer anything in technical if you want to know more about the fabric. Yeah. You know, you, you, you touch upon privacy within, you know, when you're dealing with fundamentally a, a public-based network, right? Blockchain grew on, on the basis of decentralization uh, and, and public public rep representation to some degree, right? right? And, and what I love about the Hyperledger uh, fabric network, you know, the fact that you have a private permission network, you're kind of having the best of both worlds. Correct. And right now, Rocco, you mentioned a great point. We've, we've spoken for hours on this. Like yesterday, I mean, we could have... I tired myself out talking about it. Right? It's we're we're an early adoption to some degree, and and it's it's a scary new technology to yeah. adopt. Let's be frank it here, is. right? Well, well, think about it. Think about it. All right. So you have somebody that let's say is is not too keen on blockchain. They're they're, they're trying to understand the technology, and because even myself, like I, I'm an old school guy, right? Yeah. And I come from the days where you used to have a centralized database, a centralized server. That's where everything was served, where you had your applications, your workload and whatnot. Now think about if now you start talking about all these nodes that are all over globally, right? So you're now getting into the decentralized. And that, that sometimes it's a bit of a difficult concept for people to basically grasp onto so this is why we always recommend that hey take those baby steps because there are various technologies in terms of blockchain that are available we could look at public solution we could look at a private blockchain we could even look at a hybrid solution yep. you know i come from the hybrid days where i believe sometimes a balance of both is is the better option right. for a client uh, or for an institution, but the options are there. It's just taking the right steps for it to slowly get adopted, to get comfortable with it. And the technology is here. It, it's not something in the distant future. Right. It's happening now. Yeah. So. And I, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. You know, the way I compare blockchain technology adoption is it's the internet of today, yeah. right? Uh, you know, in the 90s, when people were promoting the internet, they saw the benefits, they saw the efficiencies they could drive, but everybody's like, well, my partner, my neighbor's not on it yet. We have to give it time. It's, it's um, you know, my mother still to this day says I'm too impatient at times. This is the one area I'm learning to practice patience in. And, you know, if, if you demonstrate the value, right, if you show your know, organizations how this works, and the best way to do it is just offer a POC. Let him play with it, even with a private permission network where you're not seeing necessarily the benefits of a public network. You're still seeing uh, real time <clears throat> access to data. <clears throat> um, you know, it's a collaborative tool. You're able to instantaneous, instantaneously leverage the data with partners. Like, for example, in a hospital network, you have two or three doctors maybe collaborating on one patient. Correct. Just think right now with siloed systems, how how many delays you have and hospital networks don't obviously want to disclose this, but we know there's delays here and there and assessing and diagnosing patients. Well, what if we could reduce that time down just by 10%? I, I would love to see how many lives we could save, how exactly. we could transform people's health statuses and standards, right? And that's just the beginning of it. Once you start to scale and bring more partners into the ecosystem, I, I think the benefits are going to be tremendous. We're going to see exponential ROI numbers, right? Just, just to add to a couple of points, I, I remember, like, you know, like you said a couple of times, you know, our data center days, we had actual crash carts, that, you know, for our server going offline, right? So run around, plug into it, right? Uh, but yes, it, the, the challenges that I've, I've seen is that a lot of it has to do with um, education, right? They, when people hear blockchain, they might think about decentralized in somebody's basement, sitting in the server. But we, we have to slowly change that perception, right? We, we have to show them that they're, they're you know, we have to educate them that yep. there are options and how that can help them, right? And then that can tie into the whole POC, right? That's right. The, the best way to learn is to get your hands on the keyboard and hey, this is how it works. You know, so about, this is not going away. Uh, you're looking at what? It's about a hundred billion dollars, let's say, in in cybersecurity out yeah. there. You got a uh, hundred billion dollars in artificial intelligence. Uh, blockchain. What are we at? The number I recall. I think we're at about 
five billion in yeah. market. I think it is roughly. Last time, yeah. if I remember. So it's it's steadily growing. It's a technology that's here to stay. And here, let, let, let's throw another element to all this. What about artificial intelligence? You know, now you have AI. All right, which is again. Uh, fairly new uh people are a little uneasy about it and if you combine that or marry it up with blockchain uh the possibilities are endless so now you have some of these new up-and-coming technologies where you have the benefits of both worlds and what happens is when you're looking at blockchain itself you have that securing the path of where the point of origin where the data is coming from think about this you have artificial in intelligence where you have a lot of these engines as i like to call them these models ingest all this data now if we're talking specifically forget about all the other ver let's talk healthcare where you're ingesting sensitive data okay you're taking all this PHI data, this patient health information that's yep. being ingested into an artificial inte intelligence model or engine, and it's taking that data to maybe maybe it's uh, it's for a lab mm -hmm. or a preventative medicine, medicine where they're looking at all these x-rays, for example. Now, yeah. wouldn't you want to make sure that you had a technology that the data that is coming in is secure? What a beautiful use case and case study you can have for blockchain to handle that security of bringing that data to make sure it is secure, it is authentic, right. and it's coming for a reliable sources into the engine, the artificial intelligence to do its modeling and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, yeah, one, it's, of, one of the, um, the, the lesser things that you touched on this, right? So the, one of the lesser things that are talked about is the control that's given to the actual patient. So now the, the patient has their data in their hands and they can basically approve or reject who gets access to their data. Yeah. Power to the patients. Exactly. That's, That's right. Power to the patient. Yeah. That's right. I mean, speaking of that, it, it brings up a use case, a solution we've seen in the markets. It's Meta Ledger, right? Which is a, a base. It was developed in the US as a platform, another one built on the Hyperledger Fabric Network. <clears throat> and empowers patients to essentially control their own medical data, yeah. right? This goes back to what we talked about before, discomfort and concern about how your data is being leveraged. Now, if you ask me, frankly speaking, you know, do I want everybody to know about my medical history? Uh, not necessarily, right? It might <laughs> of give me a little bit of trouble getting an insurance policy. But, <laughs> but as far, if, if you told me, hey, we're going to use this data set, data right. set one, two, three, absolutely. to help with right. cancer but research. But you want to protect your anonymity, That's right? It. Yeah, you want to make sure, hey, absolutely use my information, but I want to remain anonymous. Exactly. I mean, yep. that's my privacy. That's my data. Yeah. But I want my data, let's say, to be used for research, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. Or maybe potentially ingesting into an artificial intelligence engine that's out there exactly. that's going to look for anomalies yep, right yep. let's say in in uh, uh lab results or in x-rays as i pointed to earlier uh so the possibilities are endless and i really believe that it's just a beautiful marriage of the two when you have blockchain and artificial intelligence the best of both worlds coming yeah. together you know <clears throat> you, you made this point a few days we actually all talked about this about ai because you know, when, when Rocco mentioned AI, you guys didn't see it, but a few participants turned their heads immediately, right? It is turning heads. It is the buzzword uh, of, of our time in this moment. And so when we're looking at um, AI, we're looking at large language models. And I've already seen some articles about, well, the data that's, go that's going in yep. is creating uh, biased information. What did we talk about before? We talked about discrimination. Yep. I could see that being a huge concern. But if you have a decentralized system, where it's trustless, where I might not know you, but we're validating something, verifying it with integrity. Mm -hmm. Then we don't have to worry about what comes out on the end. And we're not doing damage control anymore. Yep. You know, the best way <clears throat> to you know, uh, mitigate damage control is through preparing, right? And, and making Literally. sure you're aligned. Right. No, I agree with that because uh, I, I see little concerns, but again, they're addressable, right? Where you have these these artificial intelligence, a lot of these company companies up and company uh, that are that are building these beautiful models and whatnot. And again, the important thing is: is the data reliable? Mm -hmm. Is the data clean? You know. You may want to make sure that it's not tainted, it's not dirty, it hasn't been tampered with. And this is where blockchain plays a very important role to make sure that that origin, that source, before it gets, once it gets to the point of destination, that it is reliable data.
it's it's pretty much tamper proof, right? It makes it immutable, right? Um, and and that way, you know, that's it, the big word, immutable. Immutable, yeah. right? Yeah. So if anyone's trying to tamper with, let's say, a node, that's going to absolutely have no effect because the other nodes already have that report, and that's not something that you can go in and change just because of the encryption sitting on top of it. Correct. Yeah. And then you know what? That actually, uh, if you pause on the, we were talking about uh, the the pharmaceutical use case where we're able to track the ingredients, we track the ingredients, track the cost. Um, this is actually increasingly beneficial for government agencies that are trying to pass laws and bills because then they can understand the true cost. Right. In, in Canada, we we have public health care. Right, so you know, we cannot have a, an organization say it costs X amount of dollars, yep. but the government can just go in and see and track the cost of all the, the processes and the drugs that are coming in, and they can say, hey, you know what, it actually costs this much, so it's actually better for the patients in the end because they're Agreed. not paying a thousand dollars per pill and they're paying maybe a couple of dollars. Yeah, absolutely, it's auditability, yeah. auditability. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's uh, that's always a tongue twister for me. I was, I was practicing that word in the mirror last night. It didn't work. Work out, but that's okay. But that's that's truly you'll be about. all right. Yeah. You'll be all right. <laughs> but that's really what it's about, right? And, and that relates back to creating efficiency. Yeah. If if I'm able to track um, records of information uploaded, well, <clears throat> I'm not worried about whether or not the person who put the date in is doing their due, due, right. due diligence, is acting with integrity. I could move from point A to B quickly, efficiently, and in probably half the time. Right. Um, and, and it's 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 been, you know, let, let's touch upon this conference here. I mean, we're, we're live for a reason. Let's let's talk a little bit about, you know, how what, what reactions we've seen from, you know, uh, participants here have come to our booth. who have talked to us about these subjects. You know, at first they, they, they first look and they say, well, how are you guys looking at blockchain? Right. Um, and why is cloud for c partnered on this blockchain initiative? So let's let's explore that a little bit. Um, sure. Absolutely. I mean. No, blockchain needs needs to sit on something. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Are you saying we're plumbers now? <laughs> well, not just plumbers, but hey, that's a very important job also. Of course it is. It right. is an hey. important job. I mean, if pipe's leaking in the house, I am not touching that. <laughs> that's, that's the first one I have to, I, I call the plumber immediately. Exactly. When, right? the, when the water's leaking, you're in trouble. No, right. so that's, and, and that's basically a good analogy, right? Yeah. Because, you know, as cloud 4 c we are here to build the underlying infrastructure, a secure underlying infrastructure, which integrates across different partners that are involved in this. Right. So wherever you're deploying your nodes, whether it's on premises, in Microsoft, Amazon, GCP, we're there to deploy that infrastructure for my friend over here to come and deploy his services. We're node there. builders. Yeah, we're the node builders. That's it. We're the node builders, and we make sure they're secure. That's right. <laughs> Call me anytime. I'm available. If you have a project, I'll I'll jump right on it. Right, and and as far as the traffic we're seeing, and, and just the reactions, you know, this it's it's one thing when somebody says, "Hey, I'll follow up with you." It's another thing when you see a genuine reaction. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say at least 80% of the people I've spoken to have shown genuine interest. You know, we've collected a lot of contacts and we're going to be following up with them. You know, it's when you mentioned patient data management, that turns heads. I think the other big area which we talked about, R&D, clinical trial management, mm -hmm. right? Being able to provide researchers. Yes. Right? Yep. Researchers have different folk guys, right? But showing them all the data all at once creates it, it increases collaboration allows you to think more effectively and assess more appropriately yeah. right and that's what we want um and and we have to make sure healthcare is staying ahead of the game um i, I think at times you know well, w one thought i've always had or w one thing i think about from time to time is you know the the adoption rate we're seeing in healthcare versus under other industries <clears throat> and i've always thought about how we could accelerate that a little bit more right um you know, it's, I think it's easy. And you see this across most industries, right? Of course. We're happy with the way things are working right now. Yep. And then they start to see a few competitors come in and boom, they're playing a reactive game, right? How do we kind of change that? And, and what, what are we thinking about doing Jamal, to prevent it's, that? It's honestly, whether it's healthcare or any other vertical, like Osama and I have seen it all the time. Sometimes people get comfortable. Yeah. They love status quo. You know, hey, it's the old, uh, hey, it's not broken. We don't need to fix it. It's fine. Leave it alone. Um, and they remain stuck, right? And they are completely oblivious to all the 
new technology that's out there and uh, you know some of them have that mentality it's working fine let's leave it alone yeah. but if you don't uh spend a little bit of time uh to to see what the other capabilities what the other up-and-coming technologies are you do fall behind especially when it comes to innovation and technology um look i i've used my, my approach with my customers and clients or potential clients has always been look baby steps are king always start with something that's non-critical something that's non-sensitive and do a pilot it's that simple right you do a pilot you take something that's not going to have an impact to your existing day-to-day -day business uh, where you can test get comfortable with the technology and that to me is the first step to to getting exposed to the benefits of blockchain itself i agree no i completely agree and i and i think a big piece of that is that the, you know just being on that status quo and i've heard this from actually almost every single participant i've spoken to over here is that it's a maze you know they, they they've had sessions over here where they've tried to explain to attendees you know you know there's a lot of organizations that are out over here you know, yeah. different products and services and they don't know where to start yeah 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 it's an and, and some them. some of them and I'll, we'll yeah. add to that some uh, of the larger companies out there feel threatened believe it or not by blockchain um when you look at um companies like cerner you look at companies like epic all right these are you know, large emr companies yeah. right yeah. um you know, you could take a step back and say to yourself, hmm, I like to have my hmm moment and say, okay, you know what? EMR is just a uh, digitized PHI records, so right? right? At the end of the day, yeah. essentially. So what if you were to have a digitized version of all those EMR records all on blockchain? Yep. So there's a little bit of, they feel threatened by that because the technology does have potential. It does have a place um, and sometimes you get a little bit of pushback because obviously it's invading their market, but there is a fit for blockchain as a use case, yep. as a digitized EMR. Yep. It's, I think really what is key here, it gives the power to the patient. I love that. No, no, it yeah, gives power, to the, power patient, to the patient right? once it's digitized and it's on the blockchain. So. No, I completely agree. Um, you know, you, you have all these different providers of EHR and EMR, and, you know, they, they want to hold on to the data. They want to provide that value to their customers, right? But when it comes to integration, interoperability, that's when you run into challenges. You have a doctor sitting in one clinic and a doctor in another clinic, and then you're just trying to get that file across. Imagine teaming physicians, you know, you, you're moving, and now you have to figure out a way and, and pay, you know, like, God knows how much just to get that transfer record, right? Yeah. Absolutely. blockchain all you you know possibly could do is hey you know what you look access from that clinic and you give access to this clinic power uh, to the patient yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah. makes perfect sense to me I'd, I'd love to hear mohit's thoughts on uh what we're talking about here you know mohit you know as as far as mohit the three musketeers are doing a fantastic job <laughs> i need a little bit more muscle here come on we need the muscle we, we need some cryptic muscle here but yeah from from your side what are you seeing in terms of um, let's call it intimidation or hesitation to adopt, right? And, and how have you combated that um, with your time promoting blockchain? If he's, uh, he might still be on mute. Is Mohit with us? He, he might You're be. You're on mute, Mohit. Let's see. I asked Mohit to unmute. Uh, let's see if it's there. And in the meantime, we do have one question from Hector. Yes. Uh, I don't know. Can you see the chat or? Which, uh, yeah. Right. I... So there is a question here. So let me just read it out. I, I, I believe that's the way we do it, Tomas. <laughs> yes, that's the best. And Mohit will hopefully join us uh, right. so in the meantime. We have a question from Hector Torres. So it says here, what is the specific use case where you all have implemented a blockchain solution? Mm -hmm. Did it strengthen the patient, the physician and the patient? And did it address patient digital onboarding where there are specific CPT codes tied to your solution? How did it empower the patient and how does it address patient engagement? Sorry, my eyes are going bad. Yeah, there it is. So. There is one use case, I think that might, uh, it's actually a case study that we've done with a client. So um, what we had was, and it was a beautiful solution where we had a client of ours. And what they had done was 
They needed help. They had they had antiquated uh, technology. Um, this is a client that we have within the wellness. It's in preventative medicine. Again, very sensitive data uh, with our customers. So they they do a lot of scans, a lot of lab work. So they have all this, you know, blood work analysis, X-rays, MRIs, CATs, all this sensitive data that they collect. Um, and they they're into the preventative medicine. So what happened was they had a customer where again. A number of these 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 clinics we find they use a lot of antiquated systems. The technology is dated, um, very messy, a lot of paperwork. And they came to us and they said, "Look, um, we need help. Yeah. <laughs> so we need help. We need help. <laughs> we need help." So uh, what we had done was we helped basically consolidate a lot of this information um, that they had. And again, in a very secure, hardened way where we brought it onto an Azure data lake, mm -hmm. all right? And we brought the data there, we hardened the environment, the security environment, and then we created another set of blockchain principles and solutions yep. where the customer was able to engage and have access to give permission, exactly. yep. permission to basically release their information and say, hey, you can use this. And we're all done in a very secure way. Now, there's other projects that are evolving with this client. And again, that was an instance where we slowly, and this is what's key, where we slowly introduced blockchain um, into a clinic, a wellness clinic, to start using it as a secure channel for the customer to have access to his data. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, the uh, one more use case that we have South Asia where has to do with the actual onboarding of the patient. Right? Yes. So, yep. so there's an actual a mobile application, you know, any of the devices or even on your laptop desktop, you just install that application, create an account, you log in, and then your camera will basically scan your facial features. Um, and what it does is that it does like a pre-diagnosis. So that's basically a mix of AI also. So there's an analysis being done. So that's part of the onboarding because even before you step into the clinic, right. the clinicians, the physicians, uh, the relevant team members that already have the recommended information yeah. from the artificial intelligence bot. Um, and then they all they have to do is they come in, yeah. they walk in, and there's yeah. a preliminary report already created. Oh, and that ties in done. with the onboarding question yes. uh, that Hector asked there, right? Yeah. Again, if there is an ease of use, everybody's got a phone. Yeah. Everybody's got a phone, and why not use this for, in this case, for preventative medicine, where yeah. it'll take a scan of your face and start doing pre-diagnosis, take all that data that's important, critical data, yeah, so and ingest it into an artificial engine to actually make good sense of it and use it for well-being for other patients. It's a beautiful thing. Again, as we said, blockchain, AI, beautiful marriage. Yeah. <clears throat> so we've talked a little bit about patient onboarding. Um, you know, from with, with regards to onboarding, I'd love to speak um, about practitioner onboarding, yes. Yes. particularly for the home care services market. So that's where we've gained a lot of traction. We've developed um, um, a, a few solutions. We've developed a few solutions for players, not only in the Canadian market, but also in the U.S. So you have home care service providers who need to be onboarded. Now, if you're an organization that's based in, let's say, Colorado or Arizona, and you're providing services all the way out to Florida, right, where we are in Orlando. Now, you have a home care service provider who needs to be verified. His or her credentials need to be verified. You have to fly this person to one of your Correct. offices. You have to have an auditor verify all this information. This can get very costly. Let's Definitely. talk about the, <clears throat> the manual processes to schedule the appointment. Uh, that takes a few weeks to pay for the flight, hotel. Oh, yeah. You could easily see a cost of anywhere from 2400 to 2800 USD per practitioner onboarding. Now, when, when you look at a digital video identification, um, identity verification solution, right? So if uh, you guys took a flight over here, if you've noticed the TSA is using the video recognition yes. oh, yeah. technology, yeah. very similar technology we've designed in, except what we've done is we've added the blockchain network for verifying some of the details, Amazing. right? So, uh, and it's not only just for that, we're looking at scaling the solution for logging practitioner activity. Mm -hmm. You know, every time a practitioner makes a visit, has to log his or her details. Well, you know, in terms of liability concerns, let's say, God forbid, something goes wrong five months down the line, and it could have been due to, you know, an activity uh, in month one of caring for the patient. Right. Now, you know, you're dealing with a system that's immutable, you don't have to question the yep. validity of the data. You're able to 
create clear conclusions on what happened and move forward to the next one, right? Completely agree. Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of use cases. We can sit here talk, and hours. Spend, uh, yeah. talk for hours <laughs> on some of the use cases. And again, it's it's not just fantasy anymore. Uh, this is happening now. Yeah. And uh, more and more, the adoption is happening. Yes, it's still early, but it's happening, like all the other technologies in the past. And we're seeing it. Um, and again, it's really a matter of talking to your customers, talking to your clients, and getting to a point where you can do those baby steps and do those proof of values. Pilots are great, you know, you don't use sensitive data to start with. And it's the best way we found to get them introduced to blockchain and AI. And AI. Yeah, together. absolutely agree. So. Don't forget that one, right? Oh, yeah. um, now let's talk a little bit of, about how you demonstrate the value. We've, I think we've, we've done a great job of demonstrating the value to our partners. But when we're speaking to clients or we're speaking to uh, prospective partners. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, oh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the things was quite interesting what uh, I was just uh, listening to. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to Hyperledger Fabric and uh, any of the use cases, privacy and the scalability, that those are one factors. But when we take a business uh, use case and put it, right, uh, mm -hmm. whether it is for uh, a user onboarding, different types of user onboarding, it actually sets the stage where a platform is created. So we start with uh, thinking about creating a platform and implementing a use case. It doesn't stop there. It helps us to uh, uh, strengthen it and then keep adding new and new use cases. That's, yeah. that's one of the benefit of, because all the three parties are there in the ecosystem, uh, or three or more parties, and then uh, using channels and PDCs, we can create segregation and we can keep onboarding new and new use cases. Uh, so advantage here is we have the same user profile, same patient data, with all the privacy features, we, we could have multiple applications they could leverage and then even mine this data for the benefit of the user. It, so it reduced the cost, to, it reduces the initial capex which we had incurred for deployment because now we are having more cases, so more business yeah. cases. So. It's, it's creating that snowball effect, right? When they see the value, um, not particularly with, with a use case, with the technology itself, they say, where can this be applied beyond mm -hmm. that? And that's where it gets really exciting, at least for me. And I mean, that's why we've had so many conversations. Oh, yeah. Right? It, it wasn't, you know, I'll be frank. Rocco, Osama, and I had conversation yesterday, not because we were prepping for the webinar call. It's because we're, it's just an interesting topic. It is. We're exploring use cases. And, and it really. I thought we were talking about soccer. <laughs> a little bit. Just a little bit. Call it football. Okay. Yeah. Call it, so Rocco's a Tottenham fan. I'm a Liverpool fan. So we had a little bit of an argument there. But we, we pivoted quickly back to healthcare, which is good. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it just it, it makes you feel value too when you can go to an organization and really help them transform not just one or two areas of their business, all of their business models. And, and that's what we're aspiring to do. Uh, you know, partnering together. I, I really do see the opportunities as being limitless in this space and in other spaces beyond you know um i, I would say one, one last point um you know as far as demonstrating the business value so we're all engineers correct yep. we love talking about the gadgets and gizmos the features and benefits what i've seen time and time again this is for the partners in on the, on the call who are wondering how you demonstrate value and we've always talked about business value but there's always a gray area between technical benefits business benefits how do you create a balance and i think from what we've seen in our conversations you really really have to identify what the challenges are now there's an array of challenges we've seen in healthcare but really dissect and understand what's priority for them and then you will be able to find a way to integrate blockchain technology uh, an infrastructure solution from your side, from platform C side, <clears throat> incorporate the analytical piece and the AI piece. And you have a package that I think will set you up for success for at least the volatility we're going to see in the next five years in, in digital transformation. You know, listen, I, I'm with you on that. And uh, security is paramount, uh, whether you're looking at healthcare, whether you're looking at other verticals. Look, uh, business value, uh, how much is a security breach going to cost you? Have you thought about that? Look at all the class action lawsuits that are happening with some of these uh, 
healthcare providers, uh, lab companies that do all the analysis. Uh, we had one in Canada, again, multi-billion dollar class action lawsuit. You want to know business value? Look at the amount of money they're going to have to pay out right? You know, because of that suit. So you, you have to take a step back and really understand that, look, the element of security that blockchain brings to the modern day world cannot be overlooked. It's here to stay. It's going to evolve. It's going to continue to grow. And the applications in terms of where you can use it, um, it's really, from my point of view and my perspective, it's countless. Yeah. It's, 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 it's numerous use cases that you can use for it. So. Yeah. I mean, you made a great point about how important is security. <clears throat> Everybody loves to say it's important, especially when we have those leadership strategy meetings. It's always bullet number two, three, or four uh, in terms of priorities. But in, in terms of realistically setting up a contingency plan, once you get hit, how, of, how often do we see organizations scrambling to you know, mitigate the damage control? And even just the scrambling, the inefficiency is there. It's costly. Right. Everybody has a plan. There's a famous saying, um, you know, everybody has a plan until if, if you're in the boxing ring, you get hit in the face hard. How do you how do you you know react to it? How do you counter it? And uh, it's not just about creating a good plan. It's about creating a good contingency. And I think blockchain and, and other related technologies, you know, addresses both sides of the coin there. Right. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I think we're close to the end of our webinar yep. here. Um, any questions? Please hit us. We'll do our best. <laughs> and, and since we were speaking about football before, soccer. You know, soccer I, questions I, are I'll, good too. <laughs> I, only, I only take questions from Liverpool fans if that's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, please. Um, anybody who has a question in the chat, please fire away. Um, and yeah, we're, we're also open to taking in some participants if we see any as well. Of yeah. course. There's a few people walking around right now. Yeah, that's great. Um, if anybody has a question, feel free to just raise your hand. I see that Mohit already answered the question of Jeff uh, in the chat. Jeff, would you like to elaborate more or? Um... Don't be shy. Okay, don't be shy. <laughs> We, we don't okay. bite. He might bite. That guy. He might bite. He's got a big vir virtual bite. Be careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't see anything uh, right now. If But we do have maybe five minutes left before you wrap up. So if you have somebody from um, uh, the audience there, that would be great as well. Yeah. Let's um, maybe maybe one of our neighbors. Let me see if somebody. let me see if somebody from give me one sec. I'll. Sure. I'll see if well, I can grab somebody. Give me two minutes. Let me just so see. There you go. I also allowed Jeff to talk. So Jeff, maybe you can ask your questions here. Now, can, can I? Can you get me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear ah, you. Okay. I couldn't unmute for some reason. I think it would be from the host. No, I think the the question was answered. I'm just wondering, <clears throat> how's the pre, how's the private key going to be delegated to the service provider then? How's it, so you're going to have a patient a, and a service provider each having the public key to the data? Right, right, right. Let me answer. See, in practice, uh, in, in, in theory, uh, the user is the operator of the private key. But since private key is uh, such a complicated thing uh, to be operated by a user, like using a uh, mobile wallet or using a hardware token, it is not so practical because they will lose access to it. So the practical scenario is uh, the service provider or the operator who is operating your wallet uh, or it could be one of the organizations in the hyperledger consortium, they, they are having a uh, legally audited solution where the keys are actually operated on, let's say, physical HSM or a network HSM. In fact, the keys never come out and be available uh, in the database. And their operation team and the operation procedure should be convincing and should be auditable once the user says that uh, he don't want to share or he want to remove this information, technically from the HSM, we have to issue a command to delete the key. This is the only way in which uh, it is uh, the most practical way of convincing to the technology system that this key is no more existing. So 
so these are uh, these are some of the ways in which uh, user privacy and user control is adopted in scenarios where user is not actually operating the keys like for example if you are having a bitcoin cryptocurrency people are very tech savvy they would be happy to have the keys in their hardware wallets but we cannot expect a patient to be uh, especially at the time when he is sick or maybe even more serious how they can even operate their keys right it's not practical so it is always delegated to a service provider service provider you're talking about is the uh the medical uh firm that generate the data are you talking about the blockchain service provider uh blockchain means uh, let, let's say the blockchain have a few participants on hospital and few other uh, service aggregators one would be a wallet operator which will be holding the patient which is an interface for the patient to operate their data it it would be a different organization and we have to ensure that sufficient protection and operation guidelines are ensured for that that particular organization so users will transact using uh the systems which are installed there the keys would be installed there it should be in a protected environment okay see there, there are ways to implement uh, using strong cryptography or proxy re encryption stream or 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 zkp but all those cases assumes that the user is very tech savvy and uh, they know how to use complicated tools and do cryptographic operations right but we are talking about field which is in the medical area and users would be from different age segment and uh, the the scenario could be different because uh, uh, in medical means obviously the person is going through some treatment so we are expecting they don't have any computer they don't operate any physical tokens so they they operate using a software by a call or by an operation or a backend team is doing it the the best choice is that the private key is ensured to be protected and there are operation procedures which ensure that this private key is not open cannot be open and what action happened so using that up. private key is returned into the blockchain so it's completely auditable when was that private key operation used so this auditable record and the very fact that the private key is inside a secured appliance is very convincing that uh, there is nothing wrong because whatever happened with your key is available into the private permission ledger at least the action oh, 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 so the uh, traceability you're talking about yes the uh, the traceability part will tell when uh, when this user uh, action was done using his key and the uh, the the protection mechanism adopted by the wallet service provider will ensure that the keys cannot be extracted the key in the plain text can can never be coming out and if the user wants that the key should not be used this keys are deleted inside the physical appliance right right so the service provider is going to generate the key pair you're saying Yes, yes. It would be generated okay. uh, in the uh, in a physical uh, HSM sort of device. Okay. Uh, not sort of. It will be an HSM only. Yeah. Thank you, Mohit. Uh, I see there's one last question, which I think we can take, uh, and then we will have to wrap up, unfortunately, uh, because it was such a great, great talk. Um, so um used is asking could i swap my token with somebody else that i choose repeat the question again so background noise yeah used is asking could i swap my token with somebody else that um under under what context so i need, I need to understand you, mo, mo, so he's maybe you might understand the context but He's asking if he could swap his token with somebody else's. Now, now, when you're dealing with any type of tokenized asset, you know the benefit of tokenizing an asset is the transmissibility of it. But you have to make sure this stakeholder is within the permission and private ecosystem of a hyperledger network or any other private network you're dealing with. Now, you have to make sure, of course, that individual is provisioned onto a node um, and etc. You know, and, and other. Protocols and other measures are met for onboarding and transmissibility purposes. Um, I hope that answered your question, uh, at, at least from a contextual standpoint. Yeah, and, and on top of it, uh, uh, to Emal, it is about how we have coded our uh, chain code and hyperledger fabric. So mm -hmm. it's just a function. Uh, there will be two tokens, and it will swap uh, the different uh, 
public key certificate. Yeah. <clears throat> we so made it a one step, two step process essentially. Seamless yeah. one, right? Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm afraid we will have to close uh, the webinar for today. Um, I'm sorry to say that because it was really such a great uh, uh, a webinar. And thank you, you know, for also having this great idea to come in live from the HIMSS conference. I think it definitely a very dynamic, uh, very interesting uh, topic, uh, you know, to, to have you guys um, joining us live from there. So thanks a lot from that. I have to give and credit to Rocco on that, on that point. No, honestly, um, <laughs> Ro Rocco brought it up to me and uh, you, you remember Tomas when we spoke about it? We immediately right. hopped on the idea, and uh, I think this is going to be. A You're too kind. Case. You're too kind. You know what? Happy to do this. Love to do it again. Yeah. I, I think this was a great yeah. conversation. There's numerous topics we could talk about another time. I think yeah. we got a great panel here, guys. Yeah, I think, I think now, we did a good now job. going to be floating in the clouds the rest of the day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyways, many thanks yeah. to. Uh, participants yes. to the audience uh we're gonna continue enjoying 2024 hymns here in orlando it's sunny today it's a beautiful yeah. day There's lots of people so uh we're gonna go and mingle <laughs> we hope to see some of, the, <laughs> some of the members next year as well uh for, for the next conference definitely come by it's worth it yeah that's great yeah if anybody's uh watching this from orlando welcome to join um you know cripsy and cloud for see other stands and thank you again so much uh, to our panelists uh, and for this um, uh, great presentation. And if there are some questions that didn't, uh, we mean, didn't manage to get to, feel free to reach out to us at Hyperledger or directly to our panelists uh, as well. Uh, now, before we go, I would like to invite you to also check our web, uh, events page about the upcoming events. We have the uh, special interest group presentations, upcoming webinars, as well as the um, uh, in-person events here as well. Also, don't forget to visit our meetup page for the list of our meetups, workshops, and uh, also events for our regional chapters, like Women in Blockchain, organized by Hyperlight Berger chapter in India. Um, at Hyperledger, we also do a lot of uh, thought leadership pieces, so you can scan this QR code uh, to find the links to our uh, different ebooks, such as the new release CBDC book, uh, as well as the supply chain and trade finance book that was uh, released by a supply chain and trade finance special interest group. You can just scan this QR code and you'll be ready right there. Don't forget to join our Discord channel. Uh, there's uh, our community is there. It's very active. You will get your uh, answers and engagement very quickly there as well. You can communicate with the people from our projects, with our special interest groups, uh, regional chapters, and much more. Thanks, um, I wish I was in Orlando. I wish I was in Orlando. It sounds like fun. <laughs> we will. No, no comments, but yes. But, don't forget to join us if you're an organization that would like to become our member. Uh, feel free to reach out on the membership, hyperledger.org. And thank you for watching. Thank you, everybody, again for joining us. And thanks again thank to our so panelists. Bye-bye yeah. from Orlando. Have a good time in Orlando. Bye-bye. <laughs>